Eat it. Come on, praise the Lord, everybody. Yeah. Come on, let's bless the Lord. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. God has given us another opportunity to praise the Lord.
back Sundays. And uh, let him keep us in touch. So I thank God for him. Thank God for all of you. Is that Dennis? Yeah. That's Dennis. That's Dennis. Boy, I tell you. Good to see you. That's my blood law.
bless you. Thank God for Bishop Scott. I praise God for him. Uh, Reverend Raphael Spiller yes, Lord. brought our lives together umpteen years ago. <laughs> and I thank God for him and all of these preachers and pastors. Let's give God praise for this music ministry. Oh, yeah. and, um, I just believe you're going to praise God. You ought to be excited. Yes, about sir. Yes, sir. And you ought to uh, allow him to know how grateful you are to him for all that he has done and all that he is doing. Again tonight at the end of the worship I'll be right uh, out through the double doors in the vestibule area. Mm -hmm. Wrote a few copies of my daily devotional, 365 days of devotion, development, and discipline with Jesus. And I know you'll be blessed by it. I'll be honored to autograph a copy for you. They're just $25 each. And again, uh, my staff has updated me. I can take cash, check, credit cards, cash app, sale, and even a little tap thing. They got me one of those. And so I'm, I'm up to date and I praise God for that. Amen and amen. Uh, the gospel, uh, last night we looked at the gospel of St. John chapter 20. Last night we looked at St. John chapter 20. Uh -huh. Verses 24 through 29. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But tonight I want us to look at the Gospel of St. John, chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. Thank you so much for standing. St. John, chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. That's where we were last night. I'm not confused. That's where we are here tonight. I'm still clothed and in my right mind. St. John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. Let's look again to see what the Holy Spirit has to say. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. Uh -huh. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. Uh -huh. yeah. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger mm -hmm. into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, mm -hmm. I will not believe. Uh -huh. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them, Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Mm -hmm. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here, and look at my hands, and reach your hand here, and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Why don't you look at somebody and tell them, thank God for another chance. That's what I want to preach about tonight. If you could bring the monitors up for me, I would be eternally grateful. When it comes to these vitally important matters of our eternal relationship with the Lord, uh -huh, uh -huh. and when it comes to the necessity of our connection to his church, I believe that there are some very important things that we all need to be cognizant of. I don't believe that we ought to do what we do simply out of ritual, regularity, and routine. Right, 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 right. I believe that whatever we do for the Lord, yes. it ought to be a matter of what I want to call a trichotomous connection. Right. It should include the heart, mm -hmm. the head, and the hand. 
And allow me, if you will, to elaborate with a greater level of detail what I'm referring to when I use the terminology a trichotomous connection. I believe with our hearts we ought to accept the Lord. With our heads we ought to learn more about the Lord. And then with our hands we ought to serve and sacrifice for the Lord. Everything that the Lord wants us to do for him requires a connection. He wants us to remain connected to him as our source of power. And then we ought to remain connected to one another as sources of encouragement. And did you not know that even when God created us, he didn't do the work himself all alone. The Bible tells us that it was on the sixth day when God the Father said to the Son and the Holy Spirit, let us make man. He did not say I will make man. It was an us thing. And even when Jesus died at Calvary, that was a connection. The Father was sustaining him. The Holy Ghost was strengthening him while the Son was sacrificing on our behalf. And all of these things show us how important collectivity and unanimous participation are to our heavenly father. And so I need to remind us again tonight that God does not want us to be isolated from one another. He does not want us to be disconnected from each other. But he wants there to be a level of unity, a level of holy harmony in the hearts of those of us who make up the family of our God. And you know, Brother Bishop, it just breaks my heart whenever I think about the people who have left churches because they've been hurt by other people. And then it breaks my heart whenever people allow messy people to cause them to become disconnected from a meaningful ministry. I, I need to know how do you plan to handle life if the things that people say and do can cause you to become detached from the Lord and from his church. Because with that mindset, you need to know that the devil is aware of the weak areas in your life and he will always have somebody in place to push the wrong emotional button. And then for those people who say, well, I'll just leave the church altogether. Well, I say to them, what you are really saying is, I will leave the very organism that the Lord came to earth and he suffered for the church. He bled for the church. He died for the church. He was buried for the church. He got up for the church and you feel like you are too good for the church. I come tonight to tell you that the reason I refuse to allow anybody or anything to run me away from the church or to talk me out of becoming committed to the church and remaining connected to the church is because I want to show the devil that my ability to keep pressing is greater than his ability to run me away. Let me preach over here while y'all catch up. I want the devil to know that I'm 
more determined to stick with it than he has the power to run me off and cause me to stop doing what I know the Lord has called me to do. And I've come to tell somebody tonight that the truth of the matter is when we leave a body of believers because of some personal negativity, all you are saying to the devil is you won. Now, now allow me to add, don't let anything distract you, all eyes this way. Allow me to add a, a disclaimer right here because I'm not talking about people who move from one location to another location because they feel like they are not growing, they feel like they are not being fed, and they feel like they are not reaching the level of their spiritual maturity. Those all the times when you ought to leave that location. But please make sure that those are the reasons you really leave. Because there are times when people will say, Pastor Ford, I'm leaving because I'm not being fed. And they don't even know what good spiritual food tastes like. And so my brothers and sisters, when we meticulously scrutinize the ministry of Jesus, we will make an amazing discovery. The only person he spent a lot of a long time with was his father in prayer. And, and, and did you not know that when his earthly ministry started, uh, we find him interacting uh, with two brothers uh, named Peter and Andrew. Uh, he finds them uh, by the Sea of Galilee. Uh, they had been catching uh, live fish uh, and killing them. Uh, he tells them, follow me. Uh, I'll teach you how to catch dead men uh, and give them life. Uh, then he calls to other brothers, uh, James and John, uh, and tells them the same thing. Uh, from there he calls uh, a skeptic named Nathaniel. Uh, then in Matthew uh, chapter 10, uh, he puts uh, his entire ministry team together uh, and he tells them uh, to go uh, and reach other people just uh, like themselves. And, and, and there are some phrases that completely identify the ministry of Jesus. Yeah. Reverend Thomas, those phrases are things like, and going on from there, yeah. or, and after these things, or, yeah. and he went to another town, or, and Jesus went a little further. I mention all of those because that helps us to understand that there was absolutely nothing stationary or isolated about the ministry of Jesus. He was always interacting with new people because Jesus was in the people business, not the isolation business. Jesus was always looking for new people to interact with. And Jesus wanted people around him who had two basic qualities. Those qualities were, number one, people who loved to be in his presence. And then, number two, people who loved to be around the people that he chose to connect himself to. Now, now please don't miss this, because the greatest problems these so-called religious leaders who were the scribes and the Pharisees had with Jesus was the fact that they didn't like the people that Jesus purposefully associated himself with. In Luke chapter 15, verse number 1 and the 8th section of verse 2, here's what we read. Then all 
the tax collectors and sinners drew near to Jesus to hear him and the Pharisees and scribes complained. Notice what Luke tells us. He says they were coming close to Jesus not to watch him work a miracle, not to see him heal somebody, not for a financial blessing, but they wanted to hear what the Lord has to say. And I need to know tonight, is there anybody here, H-E-R-E, -E, who came to hear, H-E-A-R, what the Lord has to say? I come to tell somebody, these people gather to Jesus because they wanted to cling to every word that fall from the lips of the master miraculous maker of miracles, the marvelous manger baby of Mary. They wanted to hear God's only begotten son. They had heard about what Isaiah said. They had heard about what Solomon has said, but they wanted to hear him for themselves. And is there anybody here who knows that there will come a time in your life when you will need to hear a word from the Lord? So my brothers and sisters, the Pharisees and the scribes complained. Why? Because they didn't want sinners and tax collectors to hear. Because hearing Jesus leads to following Jesus. Now let me preach over here while y'all catch up. Hearing Jesus leads to following Jesus. And the last thing the devil wants you to do is hear Jesus and start following Jesus. That's why he tempts you with so much absence because he knows that if you get the word, it's a good chance you'll start living the word. Prince Pastor Brackett, Royals, and I'm doing the best I can. Is there anybody here who can help this bald-headed, gray-bearded preacher testify to the fact that the only reason you're living better is because you started hearing better. The only reason you are living better is because you heard what thus saith the Lord. And so my brothers and sisters, that, 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 that's the main reason. The devil tempts people not to connect themselves with other believers in the house of the Lord. Because even the devil knows there's power in his word. There's healing in his word. There's deliverance in his word. Let me try it one more time. There's power in his word. There's healing in his word. There's deliverance in his word. If you're in the dark, there's light in his word. The Lord is my light. If you're broke, there's provision in his word. But my God shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. If you're lost, there's direction in his word. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. And if y'all got a shout, put it right there. My brothers and sisters, the devil does not want you to receive the life-changing, loving, and liberating word of the Lord. One of the main reasons I'm determined to stay with the church is because I know that Jesus allowed his hands to be hurt for the church. His feet were hurt for the church. His side was hurt for the church. His head was hurt for the church. So there is no way that I'm going to allow his hands to be hurt for the church. His feet to be hurt for the church. His side to be hurt for the church. His head to be hurt for the church. And I let my feelings get hurt and leave the church. I've come to tell somebody it's right here in our text for tonight all right, all right. that we see how Thomas missed the first gathering right. of the disciples after the resurrection right. and he was living in fear he was living 
in doubt. He was living in disbelief. But notice what happened in verse number 26. Jesus showed up again. I, I, I need to take a praise break right here. I, I need to know, do I have at least seven people on this side and 14 on this side? I don't need, matter of fact, I don't need but 13. I'll make 14 who can lift, hold their hands and testify to the fact that the only reason you're here tonight is because the Lord did some stuff in your life again. You messed it up the first time, but the Lord did it again. He gave you grace again. He's given you joy again. He's given forgiveness again. I'm waiting on y'all. He's given you another chance. Somebody said it like this. He's the God of a second chance. Liar, liar, pants on fire. He ain't no God of no second chance. I messed up my second chance 15 minutes. After I got saved, I'm here tonight because he's given me another chance. Said I wouldn't do it. Another chance. Said I wasn't going back over there. Another chance. And I just believe if you know he's given you another chance, you ought to give him another shout. You ought to give him another hallelujah. You ought to give him another thank to Jesus. Open your mouth and tell God, thank you for another chance. Notice something. Jesus showed up. He knew that Thomas needed to be convinced. So he went back to the place where he told his disciples to meet him. And that leads me to my first point. All that other was in my introduction. Let me get to the text. First thing I want to deal with tonight is what I want to call the reappearance of Jesus. I need you to notice this. Jesus did not go to Thomas alone, but he did come back to meet Thomas with the group. But let me say it like this. He didn't go to meet Thomas in some isolated place. He came to meet Thomas at the assigned place. Often you want to come, you want the Lord to come to you in your isolated place. When the Lord is saying, come to my house, the assigned place, and I've got deliverance, but you have to take the initiative to move from where you are to where you know the Lord wants you to be. The assigned place uh, was for them uh, to meet him in Galilee. Uh, and many people, uh, that they want the Lord to meet them uh, in their area of sin. Uh, but they don't want to gather in the house of the Lord uh, with other saved sinners. Uh, I've come to tell somebody, maybe you missed church last Sunday. You may be watching uh, online right now. Uh, and you missed worship last week. Uh, but I've come to tell you, you need to do everything you can uh, to make your way uh, back to the house of the Lord. Uh, and if you do, uh, the Lord will make a reappearance. Now, now notice this, in, in spite of their fears, uh, the ten uh, had enough God in them uh, to stay uh, together. And when Jesus came uh, the second time, uh, they were all uh, together. And that's the challenge uh, of the modern day Christian church. Uh, we can't get everybody together in person, uh, online, uh, with a text, uh, with an email, uh, or even when we send out uh, smoke signals. Uh, everybody got something else uh, more important to do. But I've come to tell somebody the reason many people don't come to church is because they're like Thomas and they simply don't believe the report that the Lord is alive and he's still working miracles. Now, now I, need, I need to approach this part of the text from a dualistic perspective. Thomas did not believe the disciples' report that we've seen the Lord Jesus is alive. Uh, let, let's, let's see 
who's who's talking to him. Um, we've got uh, scandalizing, swindling, tax collecting Matthew. We got power hungry, seat hungry, egotistical James and John. Nathaniel, I'm surely not going to believe you because your report was can any good thing even come out of that? We, we've got Peter who has just cut, cussed, and walked off. And Thomas is saying, well, if I am able to look past your past faults, if Jesus is alive, why are you still hiding out behind closed doors? Is it possible that the reason folk don't believe your testimony is because your words don't match up with your lifestyle? I ain't scared of none of y'all. You claim he's alive, but you're still hiding out. You claim he got all power, but you're still living in fear. You claim that you know that he has kept his word, but you're living as though you don't have the word on the inside of you. We've got to get to a point where our announcement matches our activity. I've come to tell somebody. I've come to tell somebody tonight that even in the midst of all of what seems to be things that don't add up in the lives of other people, if you really want to be convinced, you just got to make up your mind and get rid of every flimsy and worthless excuse and you got to get to the house of the Lord because the God I serve, he can show up even in the midst of some ungodly folk. But then I see a second thing. I see a second thing. Not only do we see the reappearance of Jesus, but we also secondly see the reassurance by Jesus. I need you to notice this. He does not scold Thomas. He calms and he reassures Thomas. And I try to tell folk all the time when you come back to the church, you'll discover that the Lord doesn't want to fuss at you. The Lord doesn't want to criticize you. But the Lord simply wants to embrace you and fill you up with faith. Uh, he wants to calm you down. He wants you to know uh, that his forgiveness is literally unending. But when Thomas came to the gathering the first time, the disciples were talking. But when he came the second time, only Jesus was talking. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's your problem. You stopped come into church because you were listening to what other folk were saying. You didn't come back to hear what the Lord had to say. And I need to tell us that I believe that the reassurance was not just for Thomas, but the reassurance was validation that Jesus was giving also to the other ten disciples. In other words, Pastor Ford, he had spoken to these men eight days earlier. And, and, and Thomas wouldn't believe that report. But, but when, he, when he shows up again, I believe this was Jesus' way of saying to the other ten, y'all spoke up for me, so now I'm going to speak up for y'all. Y'all told somebody that I was alive. So I'm going to validate the word that you have spoken on my behalf. And I've come to tell somebody that the Bible makes us aware of the fact that heaven and earth shall pass away. But thank God the word will not pass away. And I've come to tell you tonight that when 
Jesus walked in that room, at least three basic things took place. First of all, look at somebody and tell them he calmed their fear. Here's what I'm trying to get you to understand. I need to know, has there ever been a time on a Sunday morning when your heart was aching up and fear had you gripped and paralyzed, but the Lord spoke a word and it calmed your heart and it enabled you to realize that everything was going to be all right. He calmed their fears. And then secondly, he submitted his faith. Notice Jesus did not simply remove the negative, but he also added a positive. Now, now what do you mean? What do you mean, Pastor Brackens? He added a positive. Well, Jesus could have closed up the holes in his hands, in his feet, and in his side. But he left the holes open because he knew Thomas would need convincing. You ought to thank God that when you had cancer, he, he kept some folk alive to let you know he's still able to heal cancer. You ought to thank God for the fact that when you unemployed, you have the opportunity to sit next to some people in church who don't have a job, but they still have a roof over their head, they still have food on the table, they still got a diamond in the back, a sunroof top, digging the same with a Christian lean. That's the Lord's way of opening the holes and leaving those holes open so you can know that I am the God. Sisters, have you ever come to church and seen the Lord produce some evidence? Look at somebody and say, I've seen some evidence. I've watched him dry tears from my eyes. I've watched him open doors. I've watched him make ways. I've watched him deliver. I've watched him turn negatives into positives. And if you know he's done it, why don't you give him glory? Why don't you give him praise? And he left the home token. He calmed, he calmed their fear. He, he cemented his faith. But then, but then he also, he gave confidence to his followers. Notice this. Before, before this appearance by Jesus, only, only ten of them had seen him. But now everybody on the team had laid their eyes on Jesus. Now, let me share this and then I'll, I'll move on to the close. Um, that there is no evidence that the other ten needed to see the holes. Let me preach over here. There is no evidence that the other ten needed to see the hole in his hand, the hole in his feet, or the hole in his side. Let me try this out one more time. There is no evidence that the other ten needed to see the hole in his hand, hole in his feet, hole in his side. Why are you sharing that, Pastor Brackens? Uh, you ought to be shouting and rejoicing about the fact uh, that no matter what the other ten need, uh, the Lord loves you enough uh, to show up and give you reassurance. Uh, you ought to rejoice about the fact uh, that other folk may not need to know it, uh, but the Lord will show up uh, just to reassure you uh, and let you know weeping may endure for a night, uh, but if you hang on in there, joy will come in the morning. Uh, it will help you to realize uh, there's a bright side somewhere. Am I preaching to anybody who can lift all their hands and tell God, thank you for showing up and giving me the reassurance that I need. That's why, that's why I come to church. Because the Lord has a way of meeting me right at my specific point of need. Matter of fact, can we make it personal? Can you just look at somebody and tell them, thank God I came to church tonight? Key of C, let's get out of here, Mr. Musician. I, I, I come, I come, I come, I come to tell you, you ought to praise the name of the Lord. 
everything. Yes, you ought to keep on coming to the house of the Lord. You are not allow anything or anybody to hinder your worship and your praise of the Lord. I come to tell somebody the Lord, he made a reappearance. Help me call right in, just point in one name and say thank God for the reappearance. But then secondly, he made some reassurance. He said to him, yes, put your hand right here. Reach your finger right here. He reassures him because he left the hole open. But then let me leave with just a word about the revelation from Jesus. Because when Jesus showed Thomas the evidence, that was when Thomas said, My Lord and my God, now I believe. Thomas believed because of what he saw. Have I got to witness him? Look at one neighbor and say, Child of God, Thomas believed because of what he saw. But Jesus said, Blessed are those who never seen, but yet they believe. Here we go, let's shout right in. Grab a neighbor by the hand. Look at him right in the face and say, Child of God, Thomas believed because of what he saw, but I believed because of what he said. I believe he's the Son of God. I believe he's Mary's baby. I believe he's Joseph's stepchild. Zacharias and Elizabeth's second cousin. I believe he John the Baptist's first cousin. I believe he James and Jews and brother. I believe he healed the sick. I believe he raised the dead. I believe he gave sight to the blind. And now I find somebody that said, child of God.
tonight. Amen. That's one of the things that you get convicted. You get convicted by the word. Amen. Sister Jackson, that's been going through some things that she needs to pray. Sister Ruby is asking for prayer for real shoes. Amen. We thank God for Sister Ruby always giving somebody else. Forward, man. You know what I'm saying? I, 
That's what the law I fly every now and then. Amen. So people may wonder why. Why you don't go? I didn't want to go. Amen. But I'll tell you one thing. She ain't going broke. Amen. She ain't going broke. And if she called me, I go. Amen. So I'm just going to keep on being forward and you keep on being who you are. Amen. It'll work a whole lot better. Amen. So we're going to ask the, the deacons to come now. I'm going to give my, I will also thank Dr. Brackens for his gift Amen. and for that word. Amen. 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 And I'm giving my gift as well. Every 
mercy. Sometimes we don't agree on things. And I know sometimes y'all don't need a job. This ain't bold enough to say it. But uh, I, I picked this up from Carter. That if she pack her clothes and say she finna go. I'm saying, wait a minute. Hold up. Let me get mine too. <laughs> I'm going too. You know what I mean? So she can't go nowhere. Unless I'm going with her. Amen. But uh, Greenwood has uh, got you a cake. She got you a gift. We. Oh, we. Okay, and then I got, I got some money in this envelope for you. And if there's anybody here that want to contribute to her birthday, uh, you can walk around as I walk around. I'm going to walk around right now. Give her a little kiss, a little snack on the head. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. You want to go ahead? Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I don't need to say much. Y'all see what they doing. We just gonna follow suit. Get get some, some money in your hand. We really don't want that noisy money. We, we want that fold of money. We got. This lady is beautiful inside and out. And we want we want to show her some appreciation. Give her some spending money on her trip. And her cash app is Dollar sign Wonder Woman Gloria. Dollar sign Wonder Woman Gloria. The cash app is Dollar sign Wonder Woman Gloria.
but we're on this side of the earth. And then for you to even think enough of me to shower me with the love. I appreciate each one of you all for being here. Thank you so much. May God have his face to shine upon each one of you. May he bless you in all your ways. I would like for you all to see my my real my sons and their families and their wives, my daughters. So I'm gonna start with my oldest son, Reverend Gerald Whitaker and Miss Deanna Whitaker. That's my oldest. My middle son, Curtis and Annie and family. My youngest son is talking on the ESPN right now, right. doing the Sam Houston game. Amen. And his wife is Jasmine, and they have their family. And those are my sons that are here. And of course, you know I got another, my all my uh, blended family, of the five children we have, so eight in all. Then the oldest son, the oldest son's son that I call is the oldest that keeps the three sons in order. <laughs> Robert Maceo Dillman Jr. So <laughs> he, keeps a, he keeps the house rolling. Now the special treat came out. My sister came here today. Diane, she drove from Arkansas. And of course she was waiting on me to get home to get to revival. So that was such an honor. A special treat for me this year is to have my brother, Dennis Wayne had it. The three of us grew up. We're the three last Mohicans of the Hatters. So I'm the oldest. My brother Dennis is the middle, and my sister Diane is the youngest. So we're going to take us a picture because we hadn't been together like this in a long time. So I am just so overjoyed. And thank you. I know the time is far spent, but I really do appreciate you all so very much. Now, to my special husband, I want to say thank you in all that you do and all the love that you share and show for me. I thank you so very much. Pastor Washington, I think you had to go, but I appreciate everyone that is here. And all the love, I love you all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Stand now. And, uh, let Dr. Brackett come and close us out. Again, thank you so much for your prayers. We look forward to closing out tomorrow night. Let me ask you just to be prayerful for me. Invite at least just one other person to be with me tonight so that we can close out in a great way. I want to thank the family again. Bishop Scott, it's a joy to see you. Thank you. And is that Turner? Last time I saw you, man, you was shooting little boy shooting marbles. Amen. His, his father was the chairman of Deacons at the first church I pastored. They took a chance on me at 23 years old. Ebenezer Baptist Church in Chapel Hill, Texas. I never forget where the Lord has brought me from. And I thank God for the... Now, you the one with the little old service? Yes, sir. Okay, good, good. I'm going to need you here. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. So give me that info. Amen. Again, right after the benediction, I'll be out in the vestibule. Come by and shake hands with me if you desire to purchase a copy of the book. I'd be uh, honored to personally autograph it. Thank the musicians. Thank you all so much. Amen. Amen. Lord, we ask now that you would help us to recognize the importance not only being a member of a church, but remaining connected with other believers who are a part of the church. We ask that you would dismiss us from this place, but never from your presence. And now, in the grace of our God, the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, the fellowship of the Son, the unity of the saints, may the rest rule and abide with each of us now and for that forevermore. Amen. Shake hands with somebody. Tell them God bless you.